This is one of my favorite gospels because it kind of has a nice, peaceful, sunny afternoon scene there by the water, you know? I don't know if you've ever seen uh, the classic painting. There's a couple of them of the Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman. And it has a happy ending because she who is a sinner is converted by Jesus. He gives the sales pitch. She goes for it. They have the struggle. When she finds out, she's got to do some changing. But she comes around in the end. So a lot of great lines, in my opinion, in here. And, and we need to try to understand, you know, what's going on. So it um, starts out, uh, Jesus shows up at Jacob's well. Now, the well was where many of the patriarchs met their wives. So Jacob met Rachel there. That's where he saw her first and fell in love with her. And that's the well that Jesus is at. Um, Isaac met Rebekah at the well. Moses met Mrs. Moses at the well. And, uh, and so now Jesus is with this a Samaritan woman who's not even a Jew, but he's reaching out to her. And so he says to her, give me a drink. Now, in my mind, I connect and associate this immediately with Jesus on the cross saying, I thirst. Now, the sisters of uh, uh, Mother Teresa's sisters, they have in their chapels, it's set up the same way. I've said mass to them a few times. They have a cross, a crucifix on the wall, and to the right, the words of Jesus, his last words, there were seven last words, but the ones, I thirst. So what is Jesus thirsting for on the cross? Does he want water for the body, or is it a little deeper? He's thirsting for our love. His soul is thirsting for the love of the people that he is dying for, which is you and me. He's shedding his last drop of precious blood in love for us. His sacred heart is about to be pierced with a lance, and from it will flow blood and water. Remember, the, the, from the side of Adam, Christ is the new Adam, from the side of Adam came his bride Eve, and from the side of Christ comes his bride, the church. The souls, the sinners that need to come to him for salvation, for life, for forgiveness, for peace, to, to overcome uh, sin and its damage, because sin ultimately is separation from life, separation from love, separation from truth, which is God. So we have been separated from God by sin, and Jesus has come from heaven to rescue us with his teaching, his preaching, and his um, sacrifice of his life on the cross, and then the benefits that come to the soul to us through our faith and through the sacraments, especially the sacrament of baptism, which is the primary connector with his teaching in this gospel called the living water. I will give you living water. What is that? Baptism. Because baptism unites us with Christ and then within us comes this spring of water welling up to eternal life. What's the water? The grace of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit filling our soul with that which we need. The soul, uh, the needs of the soul are greater than the body and more important. Doesn't matter if you're well fed and have a healthy and beautiful body and make the cover of magazines all your life. If your soul winds up ugly and full of sin and burning in hell, doesn't matter because the body's gone. You're getting another body at the resurrection anyway. But the soul, this old soul is all we got. And so we're hoping for it to be cleansed and forgiven and renewed. But we don't get another one. We get one for eternity. It's the same one you got now. It's the same one you're going to have in heaven, hopefully, and not in the other place, hopefully. So um, Jesus makes a couple of interesting statements here. Um, you know, he says to her, give me a drink. And then he says to her, if you knew the gift of God, ah, 
the great if. Does the world know the gift of God? Do we know the gift of God? If you knew the gift of God and who is saying, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Aha, what is this? Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. The needs of the body. We're often distracted from the needs of the soul with the needs of the body. Everyone who drinks, uh, you know, this will thirst again. Because, you know, no matter how much you get, you, you, the, the pleasure of the senses never satisfies. You always want more. So how do we get satisfaction? Um, it comes from God alone. Psalm 62, and God alone is my soul at rest. Uh, St. Augustine, you know, our, our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in you. So Jesus here says, everyone who drinks of this water, everyone who seeks life in the pleasures of the senses, will always be wanting and never be satisfied. But whoever drinks the water I will give, what is this water? The life and love and truth of God, the Holy Spirit, the grace of God in our soul that gives us eternal life that Jesus gains on the cross. Everyone who drinks the water I shall give will never thirst. His soul will never thirst because it will find its truest fulfillment and the completion of its deepest desires. The water I shall give will become within him a spring of water dwelling up to eternal life. So there's the connection. Eternal life, that's what it brings. Sir, give me this water that I may not be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw. So, Jesus has given the sales pitch. She's heard it, sounds good. Living water, never thirsty again, life eternal. I'm there, let's go. Oh, wait a minute, got a little problem. And Jesus, you gotta, you gotta admire the subtlety of him living out the work of mercy to admonish and convert the sinner. He doesn't say, well, you know, you're in a state of moral sin because you're living with a guy you're not married to and you gotta repent, you know, otherwise you're not gonna be able to come to eternal life. So you need to confess your sins, you know, have true contrition and, and, and repent. He doesn't say that. Of course, he's God, so he knows exactly what to say every time. It's not like us, you know, we get home later on. Oh, why didn't I say it? Why didn't I think of that? You know, a week later, oh, I should have said this. God doesn't have that problem. Go, call your husband and come back. Aha! The woman answered and said to him, I don't have a husband. But she doesn't know she's dealing with Jesus. She's about to get a wake-up call. Bishop Sheen tells a funny story about how um, the priest is there and he's going over the commandments and people are responding, amen, you know, don't, don't take God's name in vain, you know, keep the Sabbath holy. And he gets to the sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. And then this one woman in the back goes, now you're meddling. So <laughs> Jesus is about to send a message that there needs to be repentance if you want the water of life. You can't have all the desires of the body and all the desires of the soul. You gotta pick one to dominate your life. So Jesus says, you're right, I don't have a husband. For you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you said is true. Whoa, she's reeling from that one. Okay, so this guy can read my soul. So what does she say? Sir, I see you're a prophet. Because, you know, that's what prophets did. Prophets, when we think of prophets, we figure, you know, he's some guy running down the street going to tell us that, you know, uh, the armies are coming in a, in a week and they're going to destroy the city because you wouldn't listen to the repentance of God. It's not just about telling about the future. The role of the prophet was moral admonition to remind people of how they have failed God with their sins. Hence the work of mercy the, to convert or admonish the sinner. So then she changes the subject from the Ten Commandments to where's the best place to pray? You know, hey, but how about this mountain? This is a cool place, you know, but you guys want to worship in Jerusalem. So she's changing the subject. So then Jesus says, you know, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. In other words, the external location is not where it's at. It's what's going on in the soul. 
and then he tells her she doesn't understand what she's you people worship what you do not understand we worship what we understand because salvation is from the jews the hour is coming and is here now when two worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth god is spirit those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth so now jesus has turned it's not about location outside it's about what's going on inside because he's letting her know these are the things that are blocking you from the water of life you're violating the commandments you're living with someone you're not married to so you need to either get married or get separated so that you can receive the water of life because you know the world comes to trap us many times our soul you think about the mouse mouse going in the mouse trap well he's got that cheese oh that cheese looks pretty good i could go for some cheese i'm gonna go bite down i'm gonna eat that cheese so there he has a mouthful of cheese and the next thing you know bam the trap is sprung and he's dead with a mouthful of cheese well we don't want to be like that mouse but that's what hell is trying to do hell is trying to trap us with the things of this world and so that we've, we've, we've got what we think is going to satisfy us, but it's not. And again, the distraction of the body, you know, are sent a sight. I want to be at Myrtle Beach sitting there uh, looking, at the, looking at the pretty blue water and the sun and the blue sky. You know, I want to be listening to some nice music, drink a uh, taste, you know, nice sweet tea, drinking that, you know. So we got the desire of the senses. But they distract us from something much, much more important, the desire of the soul. So let's look at the desire of the soul. Does my body, you know, can my body sense love? No. No, the soul longs for love. As human beings, we want to be loved. We don't want to be alone. We want companionship. I want to be with my brother and sister. I want to be with my friends. I want to be with my mom and dad. I want to be with my wife and my husband and my children. I want my family and my friends. I want the love. That's what's beautiful about Christmas. We're not alone. We're together. And many people suffer a lot at Christmas time who are alone. They feel really bad. So they, you know, try to get together with friends maybe if their family's gone. So we feel that love in our heart and our soul. We love to love, right? Isn't that right? We want love. And that's not the body, that's not the senses, that's the soul. So that's deeper and much more important. So we also want to know the truth, right? Inquiring minds want to know, the National Enquirer. You're going to get your truth there, right? <laughs> you want to know, you know, if the government's about to take over everything you want to know if the thief is coming tonight you want to know the truth you want to know the world is divided over simple questions is there a god you got the the pro-abortion forces most of them don't believe in god and they're upset they want to be able to have that whole world that ignores god and doesn't care about the commandments and then you've got another division where you know is jesus god or is he not so you've got divisions over these we want to know the truth so we desire the truth we desire love and we desire life and it has its origin its beginning and its end in god saint Teresa of avila in her book she says all of the love that we receive from our family and friends has its origin in god's love so if you pause for a minute and think about it the love that you have that you enjoy from your family and friends it's god loving you through them and we in turn are grateful for the people the family and friends that are good to us that god has given and we return that love thank you lord for giving me good people in my family no family is perfect believe me folks so you're always going to have trouble in the family and even with your friends and cohorts there but we thank god for the good that comes to us and then in turn we love him so if we lead our lives in a way that we are totally dedicated to the pleasures of the body and ignore the desire of the soul and not just the desire of the soul for human love but divine love then we're in for an eternal heart heartache a broken heart you know how when you're in high school in love with this girl you're getting ready you're going to go ask her on a date and you know she laughs in your face and just your heart is just torn broke you know crash and burn trashed well let me tell you 
that's nothing compared to the heartache of a soul that goes into eternity and sees the beauty and love of God for the first time. Because remember what Jesus says to her, if you knew who it was who was speaking to you, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Do we know? Are we fully aware? Jesus is offering us eternal love, eternal truth, eternal life. And he's the only one that can give it to us. And so the desire of the soul, we should be aware of here and now so that we conduct our lives in a way that we are ready for eternity. Because if we spend our lives going for the pleasures of the body to the point that we neglect the desires of the soul, it's going to be a whole lot worse for us than it is for the mouse with a mouthful of cheese when the trap comes down on his head. And so Jesus is here reaching out to this woman. Eventually, she comes around. In fact, she's come for water for her body. And after talking to Jesus, she realized the water for the soul is even more important. She runs off and leaves the jug of water she came to get filled. And she goes to the town to tell him. She acts now as a missionary, a witness. I met this man who told me all my sins. Could he be the Christ? And then at the end of the gospel, it says, we no longer believe because of your witness. We have heard from him ourselves and now believe he's who? The savior of Samaritans? The savior of New Jersey? No, the savior of the world. Every soul is created by God. And this is God become a man, come to save them. So he is the savior of the world. And that's why he is the most important person in our life and worthy of more love than we give to anybody and anything. Because everything and everybody comes from God. Love begins in God and then it should be uh, processed, received through us and we should return the love that God gives us to our neighbor and ultimately to God. It be love and life and truth begin and end in God. So we see here in this story, Jesus saying, I thirst. He thirsts for our love. Well, guess what? We thirst, not just for a large Coke from McDonald's for the body. We thirst in our soul for the love of God. And when we pray, and, and study the scripture, it starts to kindle within our soul the fire of the love of God, and we become aware of he who it is that is speaking to us, and that he is offering us the living water. And so that's what we need to do. That's what faith does. Faith prepares our soul to be with Christ forever in heaven. And so we need to cultivate the love of God, the word of God in our hearts and minds through a life of prayer. And so Jesus dies on the cross for love of us. What are we called to do? Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple unless you deny yourself daily. What does the world say? Indulge yourself daily. Indulge the desires of the body. Jesus says, deny yourself things of the body that, that might connect you to sin and take up your cross, take up a life of prayer, take up a life of resisting temptation and living the works of mercy and saying yes to God and no to the world. Deny yourself daily, because we can do it every day. Every day is another chance to demonstrate our love for God. Deny yourself daily, take up your cross and follow me. Where did he go? To the cross. That's where we're called to go. We're to called to go with Jesus to the cross. So in the in this first story, they're in the desert and they're thirsty. So what does God tell Moses to do? Go over to that rock with the staff. Well, the, what's the staff made out of wood? So there's a connection to the cross. And they have found, they're pretty sure the archaeologists, they found this rock in the middle of the desert. And it's this big rock, it's sitting there, and it's split in the middle like lightning hit it. And there's evidence that water used to flow from it. You can see the mineral deposits. You can see it comes down the side of the mountain. And so there is the rock. Moses struck it. It was split. Water came forth. What is that foreshadowing? Christ on the cross. St. Paul even says the rock was Christ. 
and Moses struck it. And what does the soldier do? The soldier here takes the lance and pierces it through the side of Jesus into his sacred heart and out flows blood and water to his bride, the church. This woman is part of uh, the bride. So Jesus is, is seeking here, you know, the bride of the Lamb. There's Christ who's going to die on the cross. He's seeking this woman's love. That's why I put her in the mural. You see that woman on the left over there? I call that the Samaritan woman. I say, well, Scripture doesn't say she's there. doesn't say she's not, and it's my mural. So there she is. Take that. So we see the bride of Christ comes forth from his side as the bride of Adam was Eve coming from his side in his sleep. Christ in the sleep of death, the bride, the church. And what brings the church to life? The blood and water from the side of Christ, the living water. And where else do we see this phrase? It's only in the Gospel of John. Jesus is teaching this beautiful gospel, I will give you living water. I will give you the Holy Spirit, the comfort of the paraclete, the spirit of truth to dwell within you. So I will give you the living water, the sacrament of baptism, and all that it brings to you, the life of God. And I also what? What does this say? I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. So we have the two things, the living water and the living bread, baptism and Holy Communion. And so the birth of the soul and the feeding of the soul. So let's try to follow the example of the Samaritan woman who accepted the sales pitch of Jesus. Let's go for it because hell is sending you a sales pitch for you to love the things of the world and to love sin. Jesus is sending you his sales pitch to love the things of heaven, to love the sacraments, baptism, Holy Communion, confession, to love the life of prayer, to love the life of sacrificial love of God and neighbor by saying no to temptations to sin, yes to the works of mercy, yes to prayer. And so that's the beauty of today's gospel, a wonderful message. Jesus has come for the Samaritan woman and he has come for us. Let us respond to his love with our love.